Well, first of all, um, before we even get into what an angel is, um, could you tell me which angels, or are there angels that are here with us right now? Yes, um, I have to smile because looking at yourself, there's separate from your guardian angel right behind you, but there's two beautiful angels standing each side of you. And the same with the cameraman and himself across the way. Um, there's lots of angels in, in here and I see them every day. So it's actually normal and natural for me, you know, just as you see me sitting here, I see you, but I see the angels and it's physically as I see you. And when you say you see angels, um, you physically see angels? I physically see them. Um, and I can describe them to you, the one there on your left facing me. I have to say, angels don't give male or female appearance, but sometimes they do. And it is actually giving a male appearance. And I have to smile because it has a pen and paper in its hand, you know. So I know somehow you have asked for help and help is there. I have, I have asked. And uh, well, 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 we'll get into that. But, but may I ask how, um, well, first of all, let's just get into a little bit of background. Um, how long have you seen angels? I, I always say to everybody, I have seen them from the moment I opened my eyes. You know, I remember lying in my cot and maybe I was only about that size you know, and seeing them and seeing my mom, you know, and to me, you have to remember as a very young child, you know, you see the angels and you see your parents and your aunts and all of that. They're all just part of the family. You know, I didn't know any difference. I didn't even know they were angels. It was just the time when I was playing with my little brother in front of the fire. It was like as if his hand went into mine and mine went into his and it all sparkled and I laughed. And he was about the same age as me, just a little older. And it was then the angel said that they were angels and I must keep it a secret and told me that my little brother was a soul. He had died before I was born. And on occasions I would have seen him in my mom's arms as a baby, you know, when she'd be asleep in the armchair. And sometimes, you know, I would see him much older. He would play with me and he would be much older. Um, and that's a thing, a thing to remember. Everyone has a guardian angel. I just see them all the time. And I suppose maybe that very first time, even though I was only two and a half, um, I understood that I must keep it a secret and, and say nothing. And I'm so glad I did, because um, if I hadn't kept it a secret, I am dyslexic. And probably not even pronouncing it properly. That's what you're right. You know, and so I was a slow learner. I couldn't read or write. And of course, I was being distracted by the angels all of the time. And constantly, you know, they kept saying to me, you must keep it a secret. Don't say anything as I grew as a child. And the doctors had told my parents I was retarded um, because way back in Ireland then they didn't know about that. And any child that was slow, you know, you got branded, you know, straight away. So you were put in the back of the class. And I wouldn't be here talking to you either, because if I had said something to my parents, there's an angel standing beside you. Um, Ireland was full of institutions then. I, I could have ended up in one of those, so I wouldn't be here. And I'm so glad, you know, that, and I'm looking at the angels now and looking at yourselves at the same time, that, you know, I didn't say anything, you know, that I did keep it a secret, but I did learn as, as I grew, you know, even as a child of 10, I often remember aunts and neighbors saying, you know, passing comments, oh, she's slow, she wouldn't understand. And the angels used to just say to me, Lorna, they know no better. And of course, I've had the best teachers in the world. I've had the angels. They have literally taught me everything I know. So, no. still can't read or write very well. <laughs> okay. But you've read, but yet you're the author of three worldwide best-selling books. Yes, and that's a long story as well on how all, all of that happened. Mm. We'll get into that yeah. as we go along. But for people who haven't um, had a chance to read one of your books yet, 
um, or just um, kind of meeting you for the first time with this program, um, do we all have a guardian angel? Yes, every single, I, I always have to say every man, woman and child has a guardian angel and you only have one guardian angel and it doesn't matter um, what religion you are, whether you're Catholic or Muslim or Jewish or or any other, other faith, or even if you said you don't believe in anything at all, you don't believe in God or angels or anything, I'd have to smile at you. You could be the, the biggest skeptic in the world because I would see the guardian angel with you. Now, if we all have guardian angels, um, do you Physically, where where are they? Are they in front of us? Are they on the side of us? Behind us? Where where would you see them? I I always say to er everybody that your guardian angel is like three steps behind you. Now I don't mean three human steps. It's actually just this gap between you and your guardian angel. It's quite small, but yet at times it can look bigger. And yet your guardian angel can be all around you, you know. And that's really hard to explain. And other angels, I'm afraid, walk in front of you. They, they do everything. They stand at the side of you. Sometimes they can even be above you. You know, they're, they're everywhere. Like when I was walking down the street recently in, um, in New York, you know, and the street was crowded and I was just, never mind the guardian angels with everybody, but just watching the angels moving in and out between people, you know, and stopping and maybe whispering to them something that the guardian angel has asked, asked for them. Um, and sometimes seeing what I call the unemployed angels, um, helping someone carry a bag or helping a mother with a child or, or just seeing the guardian angels trying to, to keep us calm, you know, that telling us that everything will be all right because maybe we're worried or stressed about something. So you see the light of, of, of everyone's guardian angel, but you don't necessarily, um, according to your books, you don't mm. necessarily see everyone's guardian angel open up unless they would choose? Yes, and that was, I think I was maybe four or five years of age, and the angel said that from now on I would just see the light of the guardian angel, because the guardian angel is completely different from every other angel. It is the gatekeeper of your soul, and it's the one angel that can never leave you. Other angels come and go. And seemingly God decided somehow that I was being distracted too much by the guardian angel. And this decision was made, you know. Um, but on many occasions, you know, to me out of the blue, um, a stranger's guardian angel could open up. I can never say, I want your you know, ask a guardian angel, you know, please open that light up so I can see you in your full glory. But that light is your guardian angel. And that's the thing for people to, to remember. And, and again, guardian angels are assigned to us even before we're born and they stay with us how long? Your guardian angel, I, I, I think it's actually just so beautiful. Um, before you were conceived, before you were born, you were a soul already in heaven, that speck of light of God. And you already met your guardian angel in heaven. And I have to say, you and your guardian angel knew each other so well, you spoke to each other. And in heaven, before you came at all into, into the human little baby um, at, at conception, um, you had already chosen your parents and you love them unconditionally, no matter how imperfect they were, you know, and that's a very important thing, thing to remember. And when, when you die, your guardian angel, when your time comes, takes hold of your soul, ever so loving and gently, because I've seen it so many times, and brings your soul from your body back home to heaven, so you're not alone, and at that very moment, you can see your guardian angel. You, you know, and you will see lots of other angels. It's just your body dies. That's the part of us that die because we have that soul that's that speck of light of God. You live forever. And I think that's a wonderful thing that God has done this for us human beings, has given us a soul, you know, and this beautiful guardian angel that is the gatekeeper of, of your soul. And the most important thing is for the guardian angel to bring you back home to heaven.
but we have to live this human life as well. And it is full of ups and downs. Like my life has been full of ups and downs and it's been full of joy and happiness and pain as well. And I always say to people, try and smile a little more, a little more. try and feel, you know, the happiness within, within yourself, you know, and don't just focus on all the sad things or the hard things within your life. You know, see that, that light of hope that God has right there in front of you and let the angels help you as well. One of the things that I was amazed at was that um, in your books, you relate to us that guardian angels help us with sometimes everyday tasks, um, or they can do things to help us, like take the pain away from a child that falls. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about, about that? You've actually seen that? I have seen that loads of times. Um, I think when we were in the car here in Philadelphia and um, we were going slow and driving along. There was um, a mother and she had three children with her and a pram. And one of the children seemed to kind of lose its balance. And for that split second, that light of the guardian angel behind the child opened up. And how can I say, it just happened so quick. It was like as if the guardian angel's arm just went this way and broke the fall of the child. That The child did hit the ground but then the child got up as if never felt that. <laughs> you know what I mean in that, in that way. And I would see other angels doing that as well, that your guardian angel would have in and around children. You know, you know comforting them, you know, even when they're sad or they're crying or, or they've cut their knee, you know, or nobody would talk to them maybe in school and you would see the other angels trying to get them to go over and say hello to another child. Or you'd see the opposite. Sometimes I have seen a guardian angel open up behind another child and encouraging that child to come over and talk to the child that's on its own to make friends. They just literally help us in every single way in our life and we don't even recognize it. But then again, your guardian angel in one sense just wants you to, to be as happy as, as much as possible within this human life. You have also seen, um, you've, you've told us about some gifts that you've been given um, in the sense that um, you've also been able to see um, spirits of children maybe that have died early or even be, and come and be with their mother um, until while she, she needs them. Could you talk about that? Well, that is, um I see that a lot at different times and that's why I always say to every parent when you have lost a child, God will have that little soul, even though it will be in heaven, will have that child in and around you every time you think of them or you need them. That was just, I suppose, the greatest example when I was a little child and my little brother, you know, seeing him at times in my mom's lap while she was asleep in the chair, you know, he has always been, been around. And that happens for every parent and that again has given loads of parents great comfort is to remember that we all have a soul. You know, your child doesn't really die. It is just this body, this flesh and blood that has got sick or, or something has happened to cause this part of us to die. Your soul lives forever. So your, your son or your daughter, you will meet them again in heaven. And I always say to people, at times, your guardian angel allows the soul of a loved one in and around you. And you have to remember, your guardian angel can't do that unless God has said so. So your guardian angel only can do what God has said. But to me, God is very generous. He's always allowing it to happen. And you can feel the presence of a soul in and around you more than you would ever feel a guardian angel because you have to remember, you love them. They lived here, they were in a body that was flesh and blood at one stage, a human being. And I always say to, to parents, just try and to remember that and, and to remember, you know, your, your child doesn't want you to be crying anymore, wants you to actually remember 
all the times you would have laughed with them and all the times maybe a mother or father felt like screaming at them as well. What are you doing that, that for? You know, in that way, to remember all the good things because that is the important thing, not to be remembering the sad. When you, when, a, when an angel talks to you or an angel uh, communicates with you, how does an angel do it? I mean, do, do you actually physically hear an angel or does it? It's actually in loads of different ways. And I have to say, um, the angels are being, the angels can be, you know, so funny at times, you know, so cheerful, you know, they mimic us at times. And I, I know why do they do that. That's to help to cheer. Sometimes it's myself up, but it can be help to help to cheer you up. And I have to smile when you ask that question, you know. Um, they were laughing in, in, that, in that sense. Um, sometimes, you know, it depends on, on what, like just here now, um, the angels talking to me, the odd, the odd thing that they're saying is kind of, what, would, what one way would you, oh, that's so sorry. Right, so so they, they communicate with me in actually loads of different ways. Sometimes, I would say to you, it's, it's like a three-way system or a five-way system because I would be able to hear them quite clearly as I would hear you and yet hear you speaking at the same time. And don't ask me how I can separate it. I just do. And sometimes, you know, if an angel is with me like the angel Michael or Hoses or Elijah, the ones that are in my life quite a lot, and I could be walking down the road and they would communicate in, in a different way at, at times, especially if, if I'm on my own and, and they have made themselves as visible as you are. They're walking with me and if anyone passes by, they would see them too, um, but wouldn't recognize that it was an angel. So they would talk one-on-one, -on -one, if that's what you mean in that, in that way. I suppose it could be many different ways. I've never really, um, the angels have taught me since I have been a child, and I know many of them can talk to me at the same time, and I can separate it. But I do prefer when an angel comes, or sometimes when, when they come and sit around the table and talk one at a time in that way, you know. Well, well um, when people come to, to, the, to, the, to your appearances, it's such a heartfelt, and, and there's so much emotion. And when people ask you questions, um, sometimes they're looking for difficult answers. Do, how, do, angels, do angels give you information about people? How does that process work? Um, yes, they often do, you know, quite a lot, you know. But that doesn't mean I go and tell that person because I would often say to the angels, I don't want to know that person's intimate secrets you know, in that way, I sometimes I say that's enough. So you wouldn't go and say, I know all of this about you. you. That's one thing they have taught me. You never shatter anyone. You have to be so kind and so gentle. And I suppose I love everyone, you know, and, and maybe that as well is why I do, because I know so much and the person doesn't need to know I know you know, in, the, in that way. Well, I, I listened recently to a radio uh, call-in show, and so many yeah. people would, would ask, want to ask you specific questions, and sometimes you would say, um, I'm not being told that, or you would be say, I am being told that. So yeah. who tells you that? Is it, is it, it would be the angels standing beside me mm. on, on the radio show, or I, I might be on a, a telephone, mm. you know, but sometimes, I would actually sometimes have to say, I can't say that to the person, you know. And you you think and this to, to? Oh yes, even, be, and I know you wouldn't notice it on, on, right. on the radio show as such, but yes, I would be communicating silently. Yes, that's another way with the angel. Or you could, some people say, is that telepathically? And I suppose maybe it is in that, in that way. I would often say, no, I can't say that to the person. This is a human being. Sometimes I do have to remind the angels that we are human beings, as well as having that spiritual side 
you know, having a soul, you know, that's, that's that speck of light of God. And I think it is always important. Sure, sometimes I often say to God, please, please remember, I'm only flesh and blood, <laughs> you know, in that, in that way, because I'm not perfect, because, and none of us are perfect. Would you talk a little bit about it, what, what an angel is and what an angel isn't, in the sense that I know at, at a lot of mm. places that you speak, people will say, my, my little baby son passed. Is he now my angel? That's not, that's not your angel, is it? No, that's not your angel. And I, I suppose a lot of people are, you know, I used to feel kind of embarrassed when at first, now not for the people, you know, it was actually for the angels, you know. I used to feel a little, oh God, will, will I hurt them, you know. And I was told, no, Lorna, you, you must tell them. Angels are creatures created by God. Um, you and I and everybody out there in the world and those that have died um, all have a soul, that speck of light of God. So you live forever. You never, never die. It's only your, your body. You are more, all as I can say, by billions of times more than any angel. Because just imagine, you are that speck of light of God. You are pure and you're full of love. And, you know, I used to just feel kind of embarrassed for the angels and you say, oh, oh, you know, will I say it? And they just insisted, yes, to tell people this. They do love, I have to say, when we as parents or brothers and sisters or aunts or uncles or even grandparents say, you know, my little niece is an angel in heaven. It is actually an expression of love because in life we know deep down inside of us that angels are, are a living being of some kind in that, in that way. And in a way it's helping us to think of our loved one is an angel in heaven, but they're more than any angel. That is the incredible thing. They are more than any angel. Why do you think your guardian angel never leaves you for one second? Because it is in the presence of God, that speck of light that is your soul, and why other angels love to come in and around us and want to help us all of the time. So there is a heaven. You, you're telling us that you know for a fact there is a heaven. Yes, definitely there How is a heaven. How do you know there is a heaven? Um, I didn't know you were going to ask that question. <laughs> well, because I died and God sent me back and I didn't want to come back because when you go to heaven, I can assure you, you don't want to come back. Like I have met many people who would say to me, you know, oh, they would want to come back straight away, you know, and I look at them and I would say, but why would you into a human body that, you know, gets pain, gets sick, you know, going through all of these things in, in life. And then suddenly they say, oh God, no, I wouldn't want to come back. <laughs> you know, heaven is, it's God's love. You just, you just feel it. It just, it's beyond human words. I can't even describe it. And, and your soul is drawn to it. You know, your soul goes and it goes with your guardian angel. And God's love is so, it's just so overwhelming. That's, I, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, do we, do you know if you have been told, do, do we stay in heaven? Do we do we have other tasks to do when we're in heaven? What what? Um, um, the only way I can put it to you, um, we think in human ways. You know, we we think, well, I should have a task. I should be working. I should be the cameraman in heaven. But heaven is not earth. Heaven is not human life. It's beyond that. You just want to be in the presence of God. But yet, God at times will send your soul back to be around someone else, someone you love to help them in their life. And you have to remember those that have died and have gone to heaven, they can do much more for us because they can intercede with God for us. They can ask because they're already there. And, you know, lots of people would say to me, you know, well, I didn't get to say goodbye or I had this row or I didn't talk to them for years and now they're really hurting. 
when someone dies and their soul goes to heaven, they love you so much. All of that is gone. It's like all of that was trivial. It meant nothing. They just love you. And they just, they just want you to know that, that they love you. There's no need for forgiveness. It has been wiped away. You said that if you happen to see a spirit, you, well, can you tell if a spirit has been to heaven or not? Um, yes. How could I say that? How could, that's a question I haven't been, been asked. Um, it was just like, um, sometimes I might actually just out of the blue, you know, visit a graveyard. You know, it could, I could have some reason to be there. And I always remember when my grandparents had died. And my grandparent was being buried in this graveyard that kind of overlooked Dublin. And the angels had said to me, go for a walk around. And I didn't know why they were sending me for, for a walk. And I was walking up and down. And I just said a little prayer for all the families, because as far as I, what I know is that it's only the body, the remains that are there, the souls are already gone. But I had to smile. When I turned the corner, I come to this grave, and there was a guardian angel and this beautiful soul, a young man sitting there, and the guardian angel wrapped around this soul. And I was being told that the young man was a little hesitant. He had already been in heaven, but he was a little hesitant. and. God just allowed this to happen. It was for me, for some reason, to, to tell him that it was all right, you know, that his parents love him. And, you know, even though he was missing them for a moment in that, in that way, I think it was in the way the accident happened. He was killed instantly. And it was like when I spoke to him and said it was fine, you know, what are you doing here? You know, do you see your guardian angel? And it was like, you know, for the first time in one sense, even though he had been in heaven, but God sent him back. God often does that, you know, because we're his children. He loves us. He wants us to be completely at peace, you know. And it was like straight away he suddenly, oh, and then they were gone in that, in that way, you know. But yet I know that soul would be around his parents and his family when they need, need them, everyone goes straight to heaven. And the odd time, there may be a slight little confusion, but it's not really, I shouldn't even really use the word confusion. You know, it's something we don't understand. People may have a, a difficult time believing, but you say mm -hmm. that you actually have been in the presence of God, that you have met God. Yeah. Could, you, could you explain that? Um, here I'm saying to God now, what way do I start? You know, um, well, one time, what, how can I explain this? At times, the angels take my soul. And I was in heaven as well when, when my bo human body had actually died. And I have met God. And I have to just say, you know, one of the things he often says to me, on occasions, it's Lorna, why are you hiding from me? And I have to say, he always looks like a young man. He gives such a human appearance, but he is such light. And the love is just, again, it's so overwhelming. You, you, can't, you can't describe it. And I always feel like running and hiding, you know, in that, in that way. And I don't know why. I can't really answer that question. I don't know why, why God does that for me. God is real, and I know people right across the world of all religions, you know, like it could be a priest or a minister or a rabbi or, you know, a head of a church and says to me, Lorna, is God really real? And I'd be shocked when they say that. And I say, yes, he is real. And that's what we need to remember. We need to remember that God is real and we have a soul and we have a guardian angel and heaven is real. We will all go home one day, you know. And at that moment of death, as I said, when your guardian angel takes hold of your soul, you want to get there as quick as possible. You've actually seen souls 
that have died and are on their way to heaven. And could you could you talk about um, in your one of your books? I, I think a lot of people are amazed by the story of the unfortunate boys that were on the bicycle that were yeah. struck. Could you talk yeah. about that? Yeah, that happened um, when I was working in the petrol station. I know I'll have to skip loads of it, but just everything went still and quiet. You know, um, even the forecourt, everything did. And the angels had said I had to watch and look down the road. And I don't know how, even today, when I've gone back there, how I could see so far down. That is incredible. But I was to pray at the same time and to watch. And I saw these three young boys on bicycles. You know, and they were having the time of their life. They were enjoying, they were just being boys. And then I see this Arctic truck coming along and it came on the outside of them. And they all went to heaven, but it was just seeing what happened. So the, the truck struck the boys? This truck struck, went right over them. You know, I don't know whether, you know, I even saw them, you know, reaching out to each other. They were just having a great day in that way. But it was like at, at the same moment, everything was in slow motion. You know, the Arctic moving along, the boys dying at that moment, and just seeing this beautiful light and seeing the road being paved with angels. It's the only way I can, can do it. And even though the boys' bodies were left on the ground, it was just so lovely to see them cycling still to heaven with all the angels around them and their guardian angel. And they hadn't got a care in the world. It was just so beautiful. And then everything came back to normal. It was like, you know, all of a sudden, you know, in the shop and the forecourt, somebody ran in and said, oh, did you see what happened? What way did the Arctic go? He didn't know what had happened. And when you say Arctic, you're, you mean a truck, right? A truck, yeah. It, it's a, it's a, a big, huge right. truck. And um, he didn't know what had happened, you know. But it was very beautiful to see those young boys going to heaven. And not a care. They knew where they were going. It was like, you know. And there, a another unfortunate yeah. experience that while you worked in Dublin, um, co-worker of yours, could you talk about, what I really want to get into, Lorna, is that there is an angel of death and maybe not perceived the way of a mean angel of death. death. Could you talk about if, if there's an angel of death? Yeah. Um, I, I suppose, you know, when everybody thinks of the angel of death, they think of him, you know, coming to take your life, your life, you know, everyone's life with no care at all. And yet the angel of death does everything to save life, especially innocent life. You know, and that all happened when I worked in Penny's in Mary Street, the angel of death, and just seeing him separate from his guardian angel with this young man, this beautiful young man, and even him holding on to his soul as well, and being told, you know, that the angel of death had so many other angels working to try and prevent this young man's death, his life being taken innocently in in that way and so so just to be clear you th you saw the angel of death around a young man for for weeks at a time oh for i i don't know how long it was it could have even have been months i i couldn't say because i never timed time the way everyone does i i never went around saying i'm seeing this you know and writing it down in that way but i know it did go on for a considerable amount of time and I always remember, you know, just praying so hard and, and being told that people aren't listening. And, and that, that particular um, uh, man was, was actually, uh, it was in the Troubles in Ireland, so he... he that's, that's right. He, he was Catholic and his girlfriend was president. And he used to go every weekend up to Northern Ireland. Mm. And it is so sad that they killed him just because he was a Catholic. You know, they could have killed her instead, you know, in that, in that way. That's why I always say, you know, we need to all join together and not be killing each other be just because of our religious beliefs. I always remember the day coming into work 
and the angels told me, you know, he, he had died and just been so shattered, you know. So, but the angels actually tried, they were, the, the angel of death and his angels were actually trying to come up yes. with, a, with a different solution so that he wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't die. He was, they were trying to change the minds of those that were planning to kill him because the young couple wouldn't separate. You know, love is pure. And it was, it's a pity they didn't see what a wonderful sign that was. You know, you know, a Catholic and Protestant coming together in love. And you were told that the effort had failed before he actually had yes. passed? Yes, yeah. And I always remember leaving the shop, you know, that evening, you know, and glancing back and seeing him and the angel of death there with him. You know, it was really heart-rendering for me and even thinking of him now, yeah. you know, I know he's here, right. you know. I've been told if I look back, I will see him standing there, but I don't want to look back. Good. The human part of me doesn't, <laughs> you know. All right, now, moving on, you have the gift of not only seeing guardian angels, but as you mentioned, you uh, uh, and other angels, but you have actually some friends of yours or some, some very important archangels, is that right? Um, yes, I suppose, but to me, they're, they're my friends and my companions as well, and they have taught me everything I know, so I might think on them a bit different than you would or anyone else would in that way. The angel Michael, you know, when I was a child, you know, when we were living in Old Kamenum, he would just kind of appear there in the, in the corner, and there'd be other angels in the room, and I just knew there was something different about him. But he didn't tell me, you know, we became friends and he didn't tell me for a long, long time, you know, that he was an archangel. But I'm glad he didn't because it didn't make, what would you say, it didn't make any difference and it still doesn't to me in, in that sense, you know, because in one way we are so close together in that way and I do have to smile. Like I always tell the story about walking through Maynooth College you know, and any time he is with me in that way, you know, he will dress in the same clothing. But I would have to say to people, he would be perfect. So he was dressed like a priest because Maynooth College was where young men became priests and there was priests there. And um, we were walking through it. And two priests came towards us with their prayer books in their hand. And they said, good morning, Father. And he acknowledged them. But it was like as if I was invisible. They didn't see me. You know? Michael the Archangel was walking and you know, a, a, a looking like a priest. So that was actually Michael the Archangel, and you actually, you actually. I walked uh, with him. Worked with yeah. Michael the Archangel, and and you you see him. I s I see him on different occasions, and um, the Michael um, comes into my life on and off at different times. Um, and sometimes it could be to tell me something Im important or something I have to do or, or something that is happening in the world. You know, it can be various reasons. And I suppose when I wrote the book Angels in My Hair, when that came about, um, like I always remember when it was finished, I used to say, well, that's great. If one person gets one message out of it, you know, and it helps them, then my job is finished. At least that's what I thought. Um, in one sense, the human part of me. But I never realized there were so many messages within the book. And any book I write, I don't. And it, that is because I'm writing what Archangel Michael has told me, you know, what God has said, you know, what the other angels. And I actually never realized it at the time. So now let's talk about your life a little bit, if, if you okay. don't mind. Okay. Um, you were not born into, you were born into into a fair amount of poverty, is that right? Yeah. Um, like we lived in Old Kamenum first and that house, the roof fell in and we were left homeless and only for an aunt, you know. And you have to remember way back in Ireland then, you know, everybody was poor. Well, not everybody, but nearly everybody. You know, um, work was very hard to come by, and lots of fathers, 
you know, went across to England or Scotland looking for work all of the time. And my own dad even did that. So we never had much, but we loved each other. You know what I mean? We, we loved it. And that was more than having loads of things. When were you told that you would, you would write someday? Um, I smile at that because the angels, you know, they would always say I was to keep it a secret. And then with the other breathful or mouthful, they would say, and you will write about God and us one day. And even as a small child, and even when I was 10, you know, right through, um, they constantly said that. Um, but I really took no notice. And even when I was married, it was that time when I was, had my um, daughter in the pram and I was going home. Um, from the shops and I believe it was kind of a cold day that that day and the angel Michael came up behind me and I have to now that's the archangel Michael <laughs> um, and they just he just kind of teased me you know and they often do that you know and I suppose it's because the message he was bringing as well you know um, but it didn't work because when, when I did stop and, and turned and looked at him and he said, you know, you know, God has said that it's getting near time for you to write about God and us, you know, I just looked at him and kind of nearly screamed in one sense, I can't even read or write. How on earth does God expect me to write one book? And he's just said help would be sent, you know, and even then I didn't say yes. But all my life, I knew one day I would have to say yes, even though I couldn't read or write. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I could hard, some, if I ever had to sign my name, I actually used to find it really hard because I didn't want anyone to know I couldn't. You know, and it was when my husband Joe died. It was after that I said yes. And I do want to just mention your husband, Joe, in the sense that I know a lot of people are, are love the story that <clears throat> you were actually given the gift of seeing who you would marry and have children with before you actually met him. Is that right? That's, that's right. I was only about 10 years of age. And I went, um, I was off fishing with my dad, which my dad took me a lot fishing with him. And I just said to him, can I go on up the river? Because the angels had said I had a, a special angel for me to meet. And my dad said, off you go. So off I went. And, you know, at one stage along the bank, I was told to stop. And I stopped. And there I was looking around. Well, I don't see any special angel. And then the next minute, this beautiful angel just walked across the water. He was, ma he is magnificent. He hasn't changed. All that I can say is he's dressed in all of the amber colors you could ever think of. And the way his clothing is, it's like as if it's wrapped around him. You know, I, I can't describe that, but very, very beautiful. But all angels are beautiful. And the first thing a 10-year-old child would say, can I not do that? Can I not walk across the water? And he just took my hand and said, no. You know, and we sat down. And he was so big and I was so small. And we sat on a tuft of grass. I don't know how we managed to do that now that I even think of it. And he said he had something important to tell me. And he told me his name was Angel Elijah. And it was like as if a big screen came across the water. It's hard to describe it. You couldn't describe it as glass or water or, or a curtain. But you just could see this big screen. And um, he just said, you know, I'm going to show you the man you're going to marry. And I see this young man, and I was only 10. Like, you know, I'm going to fall in love. You know, he says, you're going to fall in love with him. I wasn't even thinking of those things, you know. And I could see him walking, and, and there was trees each side of him. And he was on, you know, to me it looked like at that time, you know, you could see leaves on the ground. And, you know, I giggled at the idea. You know, I'd fall in love with them because I was only 10. And he said we would marry and have children and we'd have ups and downs. And then at the end, he told me the part I got cross with in one sense as a child, a little annoyed with him. He said he was going to, we weren't going to grow old together. He was going to get sick. 
and I always remember, you know, holding his hand, or it was like my hand and his, and his hand was huge, and I looking at him and kind of looking like this, and I, I saying to him, why did you have to tell me that? You know, and I, I turned away from him and then looked back at the screen, and um, he just put his hand on my head, and he said, I will put it to the back of your mind, but I never forgot. He put it to the back of my mind, but I never forgot. It was always, always there. And the day when I was 19 or whatever age I was, um, and I saw Joe walking up the street, coming into the place where I was working the garage, oh, I knew it was him. I recognized him so clearly, you know. And I always remember saying to the secretary there, because I was looking out the window, he's coming in for a job and I don't want him to get it. <laughs> I was rejecting him, but yet so excited. And I knew what was going to happen. You know, and of course he came in and he got the job and everything like that. And he asked me out and we did marry and have children. And I suppose from nearly the moment we married, his health started to go down. And that's what I was going to ask you. Um, so, so what Angel Hosis told you did, unfortunately, did was exactly right. Yeah. You you lost Joe. Um, yeah. And and, yeah. and talk just a little bit about about the fact that, if you would please, that that Hosis's words did come true for Joe. Well, everything he had he had said. You know, we had ups and downs in in the sense of, we were so poor. Um, we grew vegetables, you know, grew a lot of the food ourselves. But yet I had the angels there. Many times I would have cried and give, given out. And just watching his health going down and what was happening to him um, and trying to help him to keep his dignity. Because at times he would, he always looked well. People would never have understood. And he was a man and he wanted to keep his dignity. And he didn't want people to know you know, so it was a battle that way, you know, but even with the children, you know, as they started to understand Dad doesn't be well physically, you know, if Dad went out into the garden at any stage or was out doing a job, they would actually be running in and out, keeping an eye on him and helping him because they knew something could happen, you know, and of course they had that experience of many things happening many times. You know, but the important thing was, you know, I could never say to him, I know you're only going to be here for so long because when he was well, you want someone to live their life. And that is the most important thing. You don't go up and tell someone, by the way, what's happening to you is going to kill you. You're going to die, you know, because then a person can stop living life. And I never wanted that. And I would never do that to any human being at all, and that's an important thing to remember. And he did live his life. He did have great times, and I know he had times that were really, really hard, and I know even for the children at times were really, really hard. Well, did you ever ask yourself or the angels, my goodness, I have angels as friends, but yet I'm, I'm you know, life is yeah. pretty hard here, you know? Why didn't, did well, you ever say, why don't you help me? <laughs> Well, shy. well, they did help me in, in loads of ways. Um, why would God treat me any different than anyone else? You know, um, I wouldn't expect him to be. I'm a human being as well. You know, I'm flesh and blood, and I'm very conscious that I have a soul and my guardian angel because I see all of the time. Um, I wouldn't ask God to treat me different. I wouldn't say to God, I wouldn't be who I am today. I wouldn't, if I had did that, maybe, you know, the Archangel Michael mightn't have come into my life then, you know, all of the other angels, all those messages. So I had to live, you have to live your human life too. You know, that, that's, that's important. Well, that's what I've always wondered, is yeah. that if you, is that, I think your sacrifice w was, to me, after reading your books, it seemed to mm. me that your sacrifices of poverty along with a lot of people that were poor, but your sacrifices of poverty, I mean, how could you have really understood 
other people's problems maybe if you hadn't gone through that yourself um, do you feel do you feel that yes I, I I believe God gave me a fast amount of experience you know of life so so that I could understand when the angels would tell me something of someone so that I could feel that compassion and that love I never judge anyone I love everyone no matter how bad no matter how good they are or how bad they are you know but there is evil in the world uh, I know you yeah. according yeah. to you and, and I, I do want you if you wouldn't mind um, on another fishing trip with your dad you oh you, yes you <laughs> saw an evil entity could you could you talk about that experience yes I I was off fishing with my dad and it started to lash rain and the angels had said you know to go up along and over the bank you know to where there was this kind of a bit of an old cossage you know standing there and they told me and I'm skipping loads of it but they told me there was something in there that I needed to experience I needed to know about and I remember being terrified and my dad getting up the bank first and he looking back at me come on and it was lashing rain and he had the fishing rods and the fishing bag and we getting to 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 this little building and I could feel straight away you know I was afraid you have to remember I was very young I was only a child and I was afraid for my dad as well you know and the door was kind of broken and he he broke up more and pushed it open so we could get in and looking around and feeling the what would I say, the evil or, or the negative that was there. And I was saying to God and the angels, well, where is it? But I knew it was there. My dad lit the fire. And then I was told it was a poltergeist. All this I could say is it was slimy. You know, it was in that way. And it did not want us there. And it did everything. You know, it made the fire blow up. And my dad knew how to light fires you know so he knew that shouldn't have happened you know the chair went moving across the room and my the chair dad moved by itself by itself you know and my dad got such a fright and um, he just literally grabbed me and grabbed everything and and ran you know um, and I remember later on me sitting at the fire, you know, still fishing because Star was trying, I was, the angels were telling me he was trying to bring everything back to normal for me because he was so conscious of, of myself and he having a campfire lit and, you know, making the cup of tea, but he never said a word, you know, in that, in that way. But yes. And now, along with, with the wonder and joy of seeing God, um, he also told you that you would have to experience Satan. So there is, there is actually, could you talk about that experience? Well, that experience I don't like talking about. You know, before you start, <laughs> okay. let me just say, we're still recording. I mean, everything's good. And yeah. we're, yeah. I just, I, yeah. I should have checked. Cause yeah. You're doing yeah. so well. I don't even want okay. to. But, so, so there is, what about that experience? Um, well, I suppose maybe go back a little further. I was always very conscious that Satan was there, but I never asked God about it. I knew something was on those boundaries. It was like a million miles away from me. And I always knew it was coming closer. And it came to a stage that the angels told me, M Angel Michael told me that, you know, Satan was going to come, you know, and I was quite terrified of it but all this I can say is as he got closer I got more terrified in and, one and sense. How long did, it, did, it, did that process take? I, I d actually don't know how long that process took. It took a long time. Months maybe? Sometimes in the book I might put months on it or years but I can't really exactly say gotcha. you know but that sometimes is for people reading so they could have a time scale. But the thing is, I remember when he was at the gate, you know, the day he got to the gate, you know. What do you mean he got to the gate? It is where God allowed him. God was actually bringing Satan. God was actually bringing Satan 
to as near as you are to me physically. You actually had the experience of having Satan that close to you. That close to me. We are about that distance. And, and, and what was that like? That was horrific, absolutely. I was terrified, but I have to say, God stood here, God appeared here. And it was right, as right if, next to you? right next to us. And it was like our fingertips touched. God touched my hand. And that was to give me strength. And I had said to Satan, because he was threatening me, and I said, you know, I choose God over him, but I had to say it three times. And during that three times of saying it, there seemed to be great, a lot of distance of time between each, you know, and each time I said it and God touched my hand, um, Satan went back each time. I denied him that I chose God over him. He just went back. How can I describe him? Words are, are indescribable in one sense. He is just evil. It's, it's evil beyond us even understanding. Even the evil and the horror we see in the world today, he is more than that. But God didn't allow him to touch me as such. But I'm very aware of him, of him, you know, just being out there. And he is out there in the world, as I just say, you know, he can do what he likes with me. You know, he can break my bones, he can kill me. But there's one thing he can't have, and that's my soul. I'm afraid that belongs to God. <laughs> Why do you think so he's wasting his time. He's wasting the battle. But he is doing everything possible to stop me from getting all of these messages out that God has asked me to do, this journey that God has, has me on. Um, but he can't have my soul. He can do whatever he likes to me, you know. And the amazing thing is that, you know, the messages are, the books are getting out there. And it is the books that are full of the messages because there's no other way I could do it, you know, in that, in that way. And to me, that's a huge miracle. It's a huge sign for people in the world. Do you think that... God appearing next to you with Satan so close, was, was that a way of you being able to tell people that as long as we have faith in God and, and love and good that we can defeat Satan? Yes. Yes, and I love the way you put it. You know? I'm glad it was you and not me that went through that experience, <laughs> Lorna. <laughs> well, I definitely don't want ever to go through that experience again. <laughs> well, First of all, I, I, now I want to talk a little bit more about the angels, if you don't mind. You, uh, the concept of what is an unemployed angel? I have to smile at that. Um, these unemployed angels, and I have to tell you, there's lots outside the glass there mm -hmm. um, looking in. Um, they are beautiful angels. They are more or less, you know, just glow of this beautiful white color. I, and I use the word white, but it's not our white. Um, and they do give such a human appearance within themselves, like it's just so lovely to watch them helping somebody, you know. And it could be car carrying a bag or, or it could be just helping someone to walk, you know. It can be just the simplest of things in that way. So that's why I always ask, you know, say to people, we'll take a, an unemployed angel home with you today, ask for one, you know. Um, to help you in the trivial things of your life. You know, I have even watched an unemployed angel help a young man tie his shoelace because he, his hands were shaky, whatever medical problem he had. And just to watch the angel kind of help to guide his, his shaking hand in this way and around this way, and then seeing the young man managing to do the shoelace. You know, that, that's very lovely is to remember that God is just pouring hundreds, I, I just say in the bucketfuls, they're just tumbling down to the earth to help us because we really, really need them. We have lost faith so much, you know, right across the world in all religions, in believe or not believe, you know, and we, we need, 
we need all of these angels. And as the other side, Satan, we can see the bad in the world, you know, and we have to stop listening to that side. One of the things that I, I know everyone <coughs> really is enthralled about is that you say there are angels at every church. There's there no, no specific church, is that right? That is right, every single church. It doesn't matter whether it's a Catholic church, a president, um, a mosque, or I know there are so many of, of all different religions. Um, there's angels there all of the time. And there's always angels praying. Where people gather to pray, there's always angels there praying. It becomes, in a sense, like um, a holy place, if you like. It's, it's a place then where the angels will go and stay. And certain angels will stay because God will put them there. And that's all religions. You know, I don't know why we're fighting over God or using God as an excuse to have control over human beings. Um, and we have to try and remember life is not just about material things. You know, life is about much more. It is about your soul and it is about God in that, in that way. And we're so focused on the material things, you know, that that makes us listen to the other side. You've even, you've said that um, America and other countries have an angel that's, that's that, that you call the angel of America or the angel of another country, and, and their, their job is, is, is to get us going. What is their job? Well, I think you're talking about the angels of each nation, mm -hmm. of each, each country. Um, and every country has this one particular angel. And all as I can say is they're like a giant and they're within the center of that country, but yet they move out to the borders of that country as well. And it's like encircle it. And they do help the people to stay together and the governments and everything like that to actually make the right choices. But they are, they never leave that country but they would be in communication with the other angel of another nation that might be beside them where a country may be in conflict because those angels don't want, um, what way could I put it, you know, both nations to be killing each other for material things, you know, in that way, um, you know, for all of the wrong reasons and in one sense, killing God's children on both sides, because right. they both are, we all are. And that's, yeah. you know, that's something we, we forget, you know. I, I don't want to get into a lot, any political stuff, but I, and I, a lot of other people were shocked because um, right before everyone in America, I can tell you, thought that the bombing of Syria was going to be a foregone conclusion, you sent an email saying that if People prayed that there was a way out of that solution, and I didn't believe. Which, where did you get the message? Which angels would give you a message? I was given that message that it came from God, and again, it was by Michael the, Arch the Archangel, and he had said, this is what was to be done. And Jean helped with that because I can't do, do all of that. And it was just so surprising to see in you know, all the different religions, even in America, you know, and all around the world that joined in that prayer, you know, and the different groups, the different religions, and even some that would said they were none, and even just families done it as well. And they would let us know what time of day they would be in prayer for that. So I used to have to work out my time. So sometimes I was up all night so that I could join in prayer with, with that particular group or with umpteen groups together at the same same time. And it did make the change. Thanks be to God it didn't happen, but we still have to keep on praying. Um, okay. The concept of reincarnation, um, a lot of people read books on it, a lot of people have certain beliefs in it. Um, you do have some experience with what you've been told about reincarnation? Um, yes, I have been shown you know, as a child, I was shown an old man sitting in a chair when, again, I was with my dad, um, that he was re a reincarnation. 
and he was born into a completely different family and that his what he was to do was to bring love to show love and I was told that that's exactly what he did but he would have had free will he didn't have to do it um, reincarnation it happens so seldom it doesn't happen every second of the day you know and I think that's what people need to remember when you die why would you want to come back you know um, it doesn't happen that often and I'm getting into trouble all of the time mm -hmm. over that because seemingly so many people have said you know as soon as you die mm -hmm. you come straight back mm -hmm. but I can assure you you do not <laughs> why would you want to come back and if God does send back a soul he, s he sends it back um, because he has chosen it's God's choice it's not ours and if he does and, and it is so rare. I know Martin Luther King was sent back. You know, um, is still, you may not be born into that same family. You know, it may not be the same country. Um, and again, still, you have that free will as well. You know, but I'm so glad Martin Luther King kept listening and still did what God had asked amazing that's absolutely okay. amazing um you have um <clears throat> let me just talk about first of all the power mm -hmm. of prayer um, um people can make a difference through prayer yeah prayer i'm always saying that prayer can move mountains and that the world doesn't pray enough and again it doesn't matter what religion you are whether you believe or not i would say to people just please pray pray for yourself you know, pray for your family. And I always say, pray for your community and your country, but pray for the world as well. You can be, you don't have to go into a church all of the time or, or into a mosque or a synagogue. Um, because I know people at times are so busy, but if you're sitting on a train or on a bus or, or you're at the kitchen sink or you're on the way to the school with the children or you're driving in your car, just say a prayer. It can be just one word. You know, it doesn't have to be a long list. But if you can say longer, that's, that's grand. Mm -hmm. You know, it is to pray and to ask with a pure heart, to ask with every part of you. And no one ever prays alone. You have your guardian angel there that prays with you. But then you have the angels of prayer. And the angels of prayer, I tell people, it's imagine the biggest waterfall ever magnificent waterfall coming down and you know all the light a waterfall gives and um, it is like a waterfall of angels millions of angels of prayer going up constantly going up enhancing your prayer you know even if your prayer is one word no prayer ever goes unheard it is heard and you were um before our interview a few days ago, you were in New York at Park 51 Mosque, um, and it was the yeah. second time that, that you had been there. Um, so are you being told that that we all, all religions should get together and that's? Yes, that is one of the messages I've been given to give to the world, and especially to America, because America is meant to be the place where this really coming together of all faiths and praying together under the one umbrella. You know, prayer is extremely powerful and it can change the world for the good, for the better. You know, and, and we forget that in that way. So yes, that's why I was at the mosque and, you know, and praying with them there as well. And just seeing all of the angels, like, you know, it, it doesn't matter what religion you are. And just seeing all the angels of prayer, every time somebody would start a prayer it's like as if before it's uttered out of you you know the angels of prayer are there and then as soon as you stop they're gone you know in that second and you could see this happening you know because the place was crowded it was like switching on lights in one sense you know just to help you in that way and the place was crowded with angels and where people gather to pray at different times and on occasions and it's you know or if it's in a church that place becomes peaceful. And 
for us all to gather together, to pray together, will help us not to be so afraid of each other, will help to bring peace. Because I know as a Catholic, you know, if a Muslim or, or a Jewish person came into a Catholic church and started to pray in their way, um, I know people would be looking at them and would be afraid and saying, what's going on? That's evil, that's bad. And it's not, because they're praying to God. It would, it's, it's for us to get together under that one umbrella and pray together and get to know each other. And from their peace, you know, we realize we don't have to be doing what we're doing. It's just so important. And it's meant to happen in America. Uh, that's what I was going to ask you next. Um, you've mm -hmm. kind of mentioned that America has an important place in, in God's plan. Could you talk about that? Well, I, I smile at that, like, because, you know, even when I was a child, um, I used to see these angels, and I was told they were called American Gathering Angels. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in Ireland way back then when I was a child, to me the population wasn't as big as it is now, and yet God had those angels there. It's not as if there is a huge number of them. Um, and all this I can say is they're dressed in armor from head to toe, and they have this band around their head. And they've heard to about here, you know, um, to here, to the shoulders. And they all more or less look alike, but there's just some little difference within them. And um, they're called the American Gathering Angels. And they've been gathering people from all over the world, from all nationalities, all walks of life, and all religions, and even, even those that believe in nothing. And isn't that so incredible? Just think about it. Have been gathered, like God knows where you've come from originally, sure. but you've been gathered and brought here, you know, to, to America. You know, you are the new race. Um, America is, is, is the gateway to a man's future. And, you know, God keeps sending me back to America because America has such a huge role to play. It has so many of the answers. And, and the biggest answer one it has is, is in changing, you know, in, that, in, in the sense of the spiritual side coming out more and intertwining and we finding the answers. And I know a lot of Americans, you know, look in at America only, you don't look out so much. But the rest of the world is looking in at you. We're waiting, you know, for the answers. What's to happen next? And it's not just about, you know, the material things. You know, it's not just about money and power from America a lot of that peace. It's like, you know, that union starts right there, you know, and the growth of spirituality in that way within mankind. So God keeps sending me back, you know, and I keep saying to him, you know, they're not really listening. What else can I do, you know? But he keeps sending me back saying, you've got to help them to awaken and to realize that you have been gathered from all over the world, that you are the new race, that you are all Americans, no matter whether you're different color skin or different religion, you need to come together as one, you know, in, the, in, that, in that way. And, you know, America is that gateway, you know, to man's future. And that is so important. And every time I come to America, you know, the vibrance is incredible. And it doesn't come from the soil. It comes from the American people yourself. You know, and I don't see that same vibrance, that same sassed for life, if you like to call it, you know, outside. It's completely different, you know, and, and just have to kind of, you know, wake up. I keep saying to you, please wake up see the important role that you have to play. I have to talk to you just briefly about the process. People love your books. When, when you read them, you're hooked. I mean, you, you just get such an emotional. Tell me about the process. I mean, you were told you were write books, but you did suffer from dyslexia. So how did the process happen? 
Well, it, it was that, you know, that day with Angel Michael when I was feeling my daughter home and he said it was getting near time for me to write and he said help would be sent. Um, it was from the moment actually after my husband Joe had died and I had said, okay, I will start now. Um, and the first person I had said it to, who I had just met, um, knew I couldn't read or write. Um, one day just came along and put two big boxes on the table and it was a Dell computer, a, a printer, and what I call the magic box, um, Dragonet, you know, the, the headpiece and all, all of that. Um, and that's how, how it started and, and with tapes, little tapes I had, the angels had said, to put pointers on it. Sometimes they would have me sitting in the bed at three o'clock in the morning and here I'd be putting these pieces onto it. Mm -hmm. And then one day, um, again, the angels had said, Lorna, someone is going to come to visit you soon and that person you must ask, um, will they help mm -hmm. with, you, with you when you're, when you're writing, putting all this together? And I asked them, you know, is it a man or woman? you know, because I wanted to know, and they wouldn't tell me. So, you know, that happens a lot. You can ask, but it doesn't mean they will tell you. And um, one day a friend asked me, could I see a friend of theirs? And I said, sure. And I think it was the morning time, and this friend brought another friend, who was Jean. And... Um, Jean Callahan. That's right, mm -hmm. Jean Callahan. And, you know, when I opened the door and saw her there, I was told straight away and her guardian angel opened up and everything. And I was actually quite nervous, you know, because I'm not used to asking people for anything, you know, in that way. And she came in and we were talking and having, I think um, my, they, they made tea or something and or had a glass of water. And I know when I was talking to, to the other lady, um, my young daughter was talking to Jean and my young daughter did something that, you know, she was told she was never to do to talk to strangers, you know, never to tell anything, you know. And seemingly she told Jean all about her dad dying and her sisters and brothers and, and when I was talking to Jean, she just, um, I think I said to her maybe she could help me, you know, getting the courage just before she was going actually. And um, she hands me her card and she says, um, maybe I will be able to help one of your children. And I said, no, maybe you will help me to write, you know. And she said, oh, you've got the wrong person. She knew nothing about it. And I don't know how many months later I rang her and asked her. And Jean was a complete skeptic, seemingly. You know, the angels didn't even tell me that, you know in that way and she came along and she said yes like i always say many people are called but few are chosen but again within that few that are chosen lots of them say no and i was so delighted she said yes and i was very nervous about about the whole lot and i think it took four years or so to put together the book angels in my hair and get a publisher and all of that. You sold over a million copies of Angels in My Hair now? Yeah. Right? Wow. So when you, the words that are in your books, um, how much are they actually your words and how much does it do an editor or Gene or um, anyone else? They're, they're all my words. I do have to sometimes fight and say, no, mm -hmm. you can't change that. That's the way it was said and it has to stay that way. Do angels give you direct input into that? Um, yes, I am being told I have to be very truthful, you know, and especially when they give words, the odd time they allow me to change maybe one word to another word that actually means the same in that, in that way. But again, that can be very seldom. It can't be done unless I get permission because I'd be in trouble. <laughs> so you know. angels really... You, is there any particular angel or is it is it um, various no sometimes it could be angel michael or hoses it could be any angel that god puts in 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 and around me that day and sometimes 
it can be the whole lot of them. Lord, why do you see angels and not other, other people? I actually don't know. I really don't know. I, I don't know why God chose me. I think he was crazy for choosing me in the first place because I can't read or write. I even have difficulty in pronouncing words in that way. Um, I often say, why, why didn't you choose someone like you or someone else? You know, he chose just a very ordinary person. And I am just ordinary. You know, I know different than anyone else out there. I would say to people, you know, they are all something. I'm nothing. They're the important ones. You are the important ones. Um, I, I really don't know. You know, the only time, any time I have asked, I've been just told, God has just said to me, why not you? I get no other answer than that. You've seen some different scenarios for the way our world can go, um, and some of them are quite good. I've seen, God has shown me a lot of futures of that, that we have there, and he's shown me many, many wonderful futures. Now he's shown me some not so wonderful, you know, and the ones I don't like to really talk about, but he's shown me so many wonderful futures. And it's not just one future, it's all of these wonderful futures coming together and becoming one. You know, it's like us all in America gathering together, praying together, and from there the whole world starts to do it. It's like from America starts something and the whole world starts it. And that's why America is so important in that, in that way. Um, what was your question? Um, <laughs> I, I think you answered it because... Today? <laughs> will you continue to write books or can we expect to see um, more books? Yes, I have written another one. Um, it's just gone to the publishers, so you know that takes time. And I think maybe next year in England it will be out in Ireland, in Europe. Prayer is so powerful. I will pray with anyone. And it doesn't matter whether they're Catholics or Protestants or Muslims or Jews. And we really need to come together to pray. It's like even to make that prayer more enhanced. And it again, it is to, to bring peace to the world, to, for us to lose the fear of each other. And one of the really strong messages is for all faiths to come together. And I know they are afraid, but I'm doing what God is asking me. I'm encouraging everyone. That's why I will go anywhere to pray. You know, it doesn't matter what religion. And I know I'm a Catholic and sometimes I, I'm told off, how dare you, you know, go and pray with them. You know, they're not Catholic. But everyone has a guardian angel. I see it doesn't matter what religion they are. And everyone has a soul. And no matter where I go to pray with people or even when I'm walking down the street, and I see a Jewish man praying, or an Orthodox, and mightn't be pronouncing it properly. I see the angels of prayer. I see their guardian angel. You know, so we really need to come together to pray and to realize it makes no difference. You know, in that sense, we're all brothers and sisters. We have to come together to, under that umbrella, to unify and to bring peace and you know, one of the futures I was shown was just so beautiful, you know. I was standing on, on a, a mountaintop, kind of looking down into the valley, and I know Angel Michael was there, and I know God was there as well, and I looking down and seeing, I don't know how many thousand people or 100,000 people there were, you know, it was, it was enormous. And they were all down there, all the different religions, because you could tell. I could see the different clothing, you know, what one religion, you know, holds or wears and looking down and seeing them mingling with each other and being together and they all praying together in their own way. Like it was, it was incredible. And just seeing those angels of prayer, you know, it was, I can't put it into words. I think you did but, a great job. But these words. people weren't ever again fighting or killing each other or fighting over God or over material things. 
everything was peaceful, everything was good, you know. Um, and I know I tried to describe some of that in the book, but not all of it. But we have to get to that stage. We really do. That's a real possibility if everybody. It is more than possible. It is possible.